doctors. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you very much for having us again. And thanks for everyone for being here. My name is uh, Dr. Butler. Please, please call me Preston. Um, I'm here with Dr. Ramos or Justin. Um, and we are both resident doctors, meaning um, we've graduated medical school. We're in a further training program at Swedish Family Medicine. So we take care of folks all the way from prenatal care, delivery, pediatrics, and all the way through the end of life. We love to take care of whole families. And we treat lots of patients with addiction. We have lots of conversations about addiction um, in our primary care clinics and in the hospital, and sometimes even through pregnancy. And so uh, I really appreciate the space to, to share some information and some stories today. And I hope that you all will also participate in that space and bring your own perspectives and your own stories uh, and questions today. I feel like addiction is a topic that uh, most people have personal experience with, either knowing a, a family member or a friend or another loved one you're close to that has either been through uh, addiction themselves or um, has been affected by addiction of uh, another loved one. And um, it's certainly a, a problem that in some ways is growing, in other ways is shrinking as, as more uh, treatments and, and treatment programs become available, but also a number of deaths uh, in our communities in Seattle and globally from um, particularly opioid overdoses uh, continue to increase. So again, thank you so much for the space to talk about this today. As Justin and I talk, uh, I welcome anybody to raise your hand in the Zoom um, or use the chat. I believe um, our, our wonderful hosts will be helping facilitate the chat a little bit as well. And I have it on my screen where I can view if anybody asks a question. If you would prefer to ask a question um, more anonymously, feel free to send it um, just to our, our Global Perinatal Services staff members and then um, they can read it out to uh, uh, to Justin and I, but um, yeah, really, really welcome your input. Um, Justin, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. We have lots of things we're going to talk through today. Um, first, we're just going to work to define addiction and talk about what substance use disorders are. Um, then we'll look some more at how addiction plays out in Washington State and our local communities. Um, and look at some t uh, statistics and numbers um, to add to our personal stories and experience. And then, um, of course, because the topic requested was science of addiction, we're also going to talk about what causes addiction at the small uh, microscopic level um, in terms of how it how substances and addiction changes nerve cells and change like rewires your brain's pathways um, in order to cause addiction to cause a process that can become a problem. And then um, Justin's going to take over later in the presentation and talk more about the treatment of addiction through both therapies and medications and discuss some more resources in Washington state. At the end of today, we'll certainly be sending out these slides so that all the resources at the end can be accessed. And um, I'm very grateful to Justin who, who put in some work to put some uh, links to a bunch of different resources at the end of the presentation. So kind of to start off, I do want to invite people um, either if you would like to speak or if you would like to put something in the chat. Um, Justin and I are both curious to know and to make sure that we cover it in the course of the presentation, what questions you might have about addiction and what you are hoping to learn today so that we can make sure to address it. Um, I also invite, you know, if anybody has um, a story or a question that they had on their mind when you all had had asked for this topic and decided on the topic to to share. Um, and uh, I'll just leave, you know, 15, 15 seconds or so if, if anybody wants to share questions or things that they want to learn or, or why this topic is important to you. I invite you to share either in the chat or um, unmute.
I'm seeing one person wanting to know more about biological predispositions for addiction, whether any genetic factors are at play and whether or not someone's predisposed to addiction. We'll definitely cover that. All right. Well, I, I don't want to allow too much time here, but we'll, so we'll get the presentation going. But if anybody has further thoughts or questions, things that they really want to make sure we cover today, please, please add them to the chat. Um, I invite, I invite you to do so. So starting off, we need to kind of all make sure that we're talking about the same thing and define what is an addiction. Um, People all across the Seattle community and the United States often use various substances for a recreational purpose. Um, we enjoy coffee. We sometimes people smoke cigarettes or use tobacco products containing nicotine. Um, people use opioids sometimes for um, uh, pain control as appropriate. You know, these are tools that we use in medicine to help people through things like surgery or uh, if you were to break a bone or have a big cut, um, you know, some of these are pain medications. Um, if you get a, a tooth removed or something, you definitely need some of these medications to help um, calm your nerves. Or if you're um, having a medical procedure done, you're really anxious. You know, these are these are all tools and medications. But what defines an addiction? When when does a use of a substance become inappropriate or or go into what we would classify as a substance use disorder. Well, you know, by the book here, addiction would be chronic, meaning it's a long-term thing um, and it kind of goes in cycles. It's relapsing and it's a brain disease. It's changes to the neural pathways in your brain that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite its harmful consequences. So this, this, piece at the end here, despite harmful consequences, is really what, what characterizes an addiction. Um, it is the use of a substance to achieve a certain means or, or going to great lengths to use the substance and having a lot of negative consequences, um, and yet still continuing to use the substance, where you might be able to look at someone and say, well, this doesn't make sense. They're they're losing their job. They're losing their relationships with their family members and loved ones. Why are they continuing to use? That is really what defines an addiction, uh, ongoing use despite negative consequences that you might think logically would make someone stop. But the way that addiction has rewired the pathways for rewards and dopamine, which we'll talk about in a minute, in someone's brain um, classifies an addiction. Um, substance use disorder is a very similar term tends to be what we use to describe addiction in medicine. Um, often we try to, uh, um, and I, I hope that you all today can, can come away with this same conclusion, but um, Justin and I, when we see someone in front of us with an addiction, we, we refer to that person as, as someone who is um, battling with or, or has a substance use disorder. Um, sometimes people are labeled as addicts, um, and that, that their addiction kind of becomes their whole identity when, when we're talking about that person. But um, we really strive to look at the whole person and, and view them as someone who has their own hopes and dreams in life, and at the same time, they are struggling with a substance use disorder. Um, so very similar, uncontrolled use despite harmful consequences. Um, we just have some pictures at the bottom here that show um, this is a, a PET scan showing some metabolic activity in the brain. And on the left here, you see someone who hasn't used any substances. And then in the middle, someone that's been using cocaine regularly for a month. And on the right, someone that's been using cocaine regularly for four months. And this is just to illustrate the difference here um, in, in brain chemistry that results from prolonged substance use uh, and, and addiction. So... Um, we'll go to the next slide, and we have actually a brief video from um, the American Psychological Association uh, to, to also help explain addiction. And Justin, I am not able to hear the sound. 
Does use of alcohol or drugs ever seem out of control for you or a loved one? Has it ever seemed like the line between fun and dysfunction is unclear? About 60% of Americans age 12 and older currently use alcohol or drugs. For some, this use can become an addiction, or what we call substance use disorder, or an SUD. An SUD involves out of control use of a substance even though it causes you harm. People with an SUD become focused on using the substance to the point where they have problems with day-to-day -day functioning. People with serious SUD will continue to use substances, even when they know it is causing or can cause harm. Heavy substance use directly impacts the body and mind, and can affect parts of the brain that control how you think, make decisions, learn, remember, and control your behavior. How can I help someone struggling with substance use disorders? Learn all you can, speak up, and offer constructive support, and don't wait for them to hit bottom. Substance use disorders are treatable and recovery is possible. For more information on substance use disorders, including treatment options, please visit www.psychiatry.org. I hope that video just kind of ties up everything that I said about what is addiction and what is a substance use disorder into a neat little bow um, and, and gives you that idea. Again, ongoing use despite negative consequences um, uh, leading to a lot of behaviors to uh, go to great lengths to use a substance. And uh, we just wanted to review what some of these substances can be. I'm sure lots of folks have had personal experience or or heard about a lot of these substances in the media, um, in movies or TV shows or books, sometimes represented accurately, other times not so much. Um, and and these these tend to really be the substances that can lead to an addiction that actually change some brain chemistry. So... We have things that you can inhale, um, like uh, fumes of paint or um, fuels. Um, of course, some people use med uh, substances like cocaine. Um, there are many types of opioids, such as heroin or fentanyl. Um, some people misuse marijuana. Uh, although that doesn't cause as many brain chemistry changes, it still can be a substance that people use consistently despite negative consequences. It's really, again, when things flip into an addiction. Um, <clears throat> some stimulant medications, such as um, cocaine or um, medications that are used for treatment of things like ADHD can be misused. Um, there's some hallucinogens, uh, like PCP or, um, um, help me out here, Justin, what was the other thing I'm thinking of? Uh, an old party drug from the seventies. I guess some people refer to it as acid. Um, and then there's also potential for misuse of over-the-counter medications that have addictive properties, um, and, uh, you know, Sudafed is, is regulated for that reason. And then uh, methamphetamine. Again, a lot of these medications are perfectly reasonable for use for a medical indication at some point, um, but can potentially lead to an addiction. And so how does that happen? Um, well, well, we'll talk a little more first about how addiction affects everyone in Washington state. Um, unfortunately, drug use does cause a lot of mortality or death in addition to people struggling with finances and their personal relationships and their personal health. Um, ultimately, it can result in deaths. You'll see here the number of deaths from uh, attributed to drug use and drug overdose in Washington state from the years 2017 up to 2020. Um, you'll see that around 2019, there's a, a kind of change in how steep the curve is that continues to this day. And that's really reflecting actually the arrival of fentanyl uh, into the area. It has been present and widely used in some other cities on the East Coast. I actually did a lot of training, medical training in Boston and um, had seen a lot of fentanyl use previously before moving here and have seen it, unfortunately, kind of come into the more drug supply in, in the city of Seattle as well recently. Um, 
for for fentanyl, it unfortunately has a, a higher chance of causing overdose because it doesn't stay in your system quite as long. But just just to to restate the importance of what we're talking about today, you see the the dotted black line at the top is number of total deaths from drug use, and the blue line uh, right below that is the number of those deaths that can be contributed uh, attributed to opioid use, things like heroin or fentanyl or Percocets. Um, they go by many different names. Blues sometimes is a street name for them. Um, and so that's really the one that's causing so many overdose, overdose deaths. Um, of those specifically, the orange line below is the number of those deaths attributed to fentanyl specifically of all opioids. Um, and then you'll see, you know, heroin and methamphetamine also lead to deaths and, and mortality. Um, morbidity and mortality, meaning like health changes and death long-term, um, but not quite as much as opioids. So, and how, let's see, I believe next we're going to talk about how some people become addicted and some some don't. So this kind of goes toward the, the question raised at the beginning of how do, um, it, sorry, is there a biological predisposition to addiction? And the answer is yes, there can be. Um, not everyone that has a family history of addiction to substances like alcohol or uh, opioids is going to be um, addicted if they, if they use those medications appropriately or if they have um, alcohol a couple times per week socially as a recreational uh, activity. Um, but it does predispose people if they have a family history um, toward addiction. You'll see here up on the left, we have biology and your genes, your genetic makeup, the, the DNA information that you get from both parents. Um, and on the right, your environment. You know, are you around people in your family that tend to use substances? Are you around friends that tend to use substances and not only use them, but use them frequently? go to great lengths to use them? Are you around anyone else that is um, suffering from addiction and maybe encouraging you to do the same? Um, <clears throat> this kind of sets the stage for when you introduce a substance such as alcohol or opioids or methamphetamines and then use it frequently, um, maybe, um, I'm just seeing here, yeah, um, the the frequency of which you use it or how you use it kind of plays into how you end up developing addiction. Again, not everybody does. Some people are more prone to it than others. You can see on this chart, there's some other things that affect whether or not people are able to develop an addiction to something. What are the barriers to using it at the beginning? You know, is it available in your community? Is it like cigarettes or tobacco where you can just go to the gas station and buy it? Um, if you can, how much does that cost and how much money are you making and where does this fit in for um, your budget? Um, uh, a lot of people cite that as one of the negatives of, of their ongoing substance use is just the money that it costs to buy alcohol or buy to, tobacco products. Um, and again, it's an addiction because of consistent use um, just by recognizing that negative consequences. And then these substances can cause changes in your brain that then lead to addiction, the red there at the bottom. So lots of different factors that go into this. And, and it's just a nice job to kind of talk to patients when they come into the clinic about this and say, what are all the things affecting how you um, are, are struggling with addiction? And how can we put some more supports in place upstream um, in your social environment to help you with treatment as well? We'll now go into a little more depth of those specific changes on the cellular level. So the, the frequent use of substances or misuse of substances over time does cause changes in what we call neurotransmitters in your brain. I like to think of neurotransmitters as little messages or little letters that are sent from one brain cell to another brain cell. So if I want to send a note to Dr. Ramos, um, then I'll just write on a piece of paper, you know, Justin, I want to meet you today at 2 p.m. to prepare our addiction presentation for today's talk. And I'll send that message to Justin and he'll say, OK, great. I, I've got one message here. I I'm, I'm, see that this is important. I'm going to meet Preston at two o'clock and we're going to go over our presentation. 
But think about what if I was sending Justin 10 messages per day? And then what if those 10 messages became 20 messages and 30 messages? And all of a sudden, Justin is so overwhelmed. He's trying to do his job and go about his normal day. And some of the messages I'm sending him are really important. Like, hey, let's meet at two o'clock. We're going to go over our presentation. And some of them just say hi <laughs> and nothing else. And it's just noise. Sometimes, you know, I think it'd be reasonable for Justin to start paying less attention to that those messages that come through and kind of getting lost in, you know, what's important here? What do I need to know? And that's kind of the same way that addiction works. Um, use of these substances, like um, let's say an opioid, for example, if someone uses fentanyl or, or smokes some, some Percocets, um, then the number of neurotransmitters or little messages that are sent from one brain cell to another is at a normal rate. And then all of a sudden, when you use the substance and you, you activate these reward centers of your brain, your, your brain is sending so many messages all of a sudden, and it makes you feel really good. Um, and then your brain gets over time used to that number of messages, the, the more signal, to the to the point where when you're not using substances it it's like you know what's going on here i'm i'm used to receiving a lot more neurotransmitters and and that's when you start going through withdrawal symptoms which is a motivation to start using the substance again and get back to that normal number of messages that you're sending um in this case in addiction often the pathways that we're talking about that get changed over time use the neurotransmitter called dopamine Maybe people have heard of dopamine before. It is a, a chemical that often gets released actually when you and like eat a sweet treat or give yourself a reward at the end of the day um, for a, a hard day's work. Or if you have a pet, like a dog, you know, when your dog sits and you give them a treat as a reward, that's activating the dopamine in their brain to reinforce that pathway and say, hey, this was good. This made me feel good. This is a reward. And substances, unfortunately, do the exact same thing. And that is how we end up getting addiction over time. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide, Justin. And this kind of shows the, the same thing that I was describing here. Um, on the left, you can see, oh yeah, dopamine also gets released when we eat really good food sometimes too. And that's appropriate. You know, your body's hungry, it wants good food. It's gonna uh, reinforce whatever you did to cook that meal and get that good meal. And the same thing can happen with drugs. Um, so on the left, you have not as much uh, dopamine being transmitted from one cell to another. And on the right, while using cocaine, you have a lot more of that, those signals, those messages going back and forth. Um, and so the brain adapts here. This is exactly what I was just talking about with, you know, if I'm sending a lot of messages to Justin, he's going to adapt to a new expectation that I'm going to get 30 messages from Preston every day. And then if I, if, he all of a sudden doesn't, then he's going to say, well, how can I get those messages back? Um, I want that reward. I want that good feeling. Maybe Justin really likes getting messages from me. Um, I'm, I'm taking this analogy too far at this point, but um, we, you know, you could stay the same for, for a lot of different things. I hope, I hope that resonates and, and feels clear to folks. Um, so again, we're, we're changing those dopamine reward pathways in the brain. Um, and, and that kind of compels you to always having to be taking more drugs in order to get the same level of euphoria or the same uh, positive response because your body is so used to a new set point um, that you have to use more and more and more, uh, maybe to achieve that euphoria or to just avoid withdrawal symptoms. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Butler, for going over the nitty gritty details of what it means to become addicted to a substance. I will go now more into treatment options because I think that is um, the bulk of what it means to um, get addiction treated in a way that's helpful and in a way that promotes uh, better outcomes for our patients. Um, so in this question specifically, it talks about can addiction be treated successfully? And the short answer is yes. Um, we've seen it in so many of our patients at our clinics and in the hospital. Um, and 
addiction treatment is really a comprehensive interdisciplinary approach that involves more than one person. It involves more than just your doctor at clinic. Um, it really does involve other people, including therapists who can provide counseling, group therapy, which for some are can be very helpful, knowing that there are other people like you struggling with certain issues and that you can find um, a lot of support that way. And for some people, they actually go more into family therapy as well. And then detox is also a way for patients to get treated in a way that helps them at least get to a better place where they're able to maintain their addiction and that be through medications and therapy as well. Um, research has shown that combining addiction treatment medications, so um, medications for specifically for alcohol use or um, methamphetamine use can be very helpful in addition to seeing a therapist. So someone that you can talk to about your issues. Um, this treatment approaches are very tailored to specific patterns in the way that you are using substances. And it really does involve more than just the medical aspects. So psychiatric, it looks into your social history and seeing what are some of the triggers that are causing a person to become addicted. Um, and the most important thing that I think we should take away from this slide is that it does show that treatment is stage six, um, but really addiction is also, um, it can be a journey for some patients. Um, it really involves more than one conversation. Um, for some people, it involves multiple visits at the medical clinic or office and um, it can take months to even like years to get treated and it doesn't mean that you're not succeeding it just means that um, there just needs to be more of an approach in the way how we're treating a patient um, for some patients who are still in the stage of what's known as pre-contemplation they're haven't really thought about how addiction is impacting their lives. And for some patients, they remain in that stage for so long before they start seeking treatment. And um, it really is a, a journey for us to continuing to have those conversations with patients. And um, at least that's something that we've also seen in our clinics and the patients that we treat. Uh, this next slide here, talks about relapse. Um, so relapse specifically refers to uh, essentially when you're returning to use after having stopped the specific substance. Um, does relapse mean that the treatment has failed? The short answer is no. Um, a lot of people relapse after being off of a medication. A lot of them return to use. A lot of them have difficulties completely stopping. Um, but the good thing is that newer treatment options are designed to help with relapse prevention. We've seen this a lot specifically with like alcohol use disorder, where there are injectable forms of medications that can be very helpful for patients um, who struggle with taking a pill every day. Um, and there's also other options for opiate use disorder as well. Um, the most interesting thing is that the chart on the right looks at relapse rates between substance use disorders and other chronic illnesses, specifically hypertension, which is high blood pressure, as well as asthma, which is a chronic lung condition. And if you were to look at the bars, um, the relapse rates for people's treated for substance use disorders are pretty similar to those with asthma and high blood pressure. Um, that's all to say that uh, substance use disorders should be treated like any other chronic illness. It should be addressed at every visit. Um, and a lot of what it involves is really changing deeply rooted behaviors in the way that we think and it, it takes more than one conversation to get that ha to happen at times. Um, the other thing we should talk about as well is overdose, specifically for those who do relapse. Um, as Preston had, or Dr. Butler had mentioned before, the more you use a substance, the more you develop tolerance and dependence on it, which basically means that you need an increased use of that medication or that uh, specific drug in order to feel a similar effect as before. 
And a lot of times for patients that could lead to dangerous levels of drug exposure and uh, overdose, which we had talked about in terms of that slide that looked at drug related deaths in Washington state, specifically from opioid use. Um, so I think it's really important to keep in mind um, overdose specifically when thinking about how we treat and approach patients. So I talked about some of this already, but the question here is what are the principles of effective treatment? So as I mentioned before, there's really two approaches that work um, very, they coincide um, and research has shown that both together have been very helpful. So medications, so as mentioned, there's medications to treat opioid medications or prescription pain relievers or drugs like heroin or fentanyl. Um, for those, medications should be the first line of treatment and it's usually combined with some form of talk therapy. So seeing a therapist, seeing uh, what's known as a chemical dependency counselor. Um, and then also medications to use to help treat addiction to alcohol and nicotine. Um, I know one of the participants, Mahab, had shared that they are struggling with um, alcohol addiction and they're looking for tips to help stop. So here is where I think it's a good point to mention that there are medications to help with alcohol use disorder. There's a pill that Tim, you Tim, can sorry, take. Doctor, doctor. Oh. Tim. Oh. Um, so there are medication options used to treat um, alcohol use disorder. And there's also uh, newer forms of injections, which um, make it easier to take because you're not doing an oral daily pill. Um, and then this here also talks more about like detoxification, which basically means getting you off of the drug and completely sober. The issue with detox programs is that there's not really a long-term maintenance program afterwards. Um, that would prevent you from relapsing. So it really does require a lot of um, aftercare follow-up for those who end up having to detox, whether it be through home or through a detox facility. Um, and then behavioral health therapy, as mentioned, um, for those who are addicted to drugs like stimulants or cannabis, there are no medications currently available to assist in these treatments. Um, there are medications used to treat symptoms of withdrawal from cannabis or stimulants, but for the most part, we usually recommend talk therapy. So seeing a therapist, um, usually your primary care provider can be very helpful in referring you to a specific therapist that would be helpful. Um, and then this therapist can talk more about where your triggers are in addiction. Um, it helps you kind of reframe your thinking in a way that's helpful and productive for you. Um, so as I mentioned before, drug addiction treatment is really a comprehensive approach. You can see here in the center that a lot of it involves close monitoring, clinical and case management. Sometimes patients are seen to case manager. Um, some patients uh, attend recovery support programs and um, all of the surrounding uh, services here are services that a patient could access to or additional support. Uh, education, mental health, medical, vocational, family legal services, and HIV and AIDS, which is also very directly correlated to addiction use and specifically IV drug use. Um, the most important thing I want to mention in terms of like medications is that there's specific medications for different reasons. So for those used to like treat withdrawal symptoms, um, these medications are usually used to help those who experience like restlessness or sleeplessness, depression, anxiety after being off of a medication. Um, and then there's, a, there's also medications that are used to help you stay in treatment. So what's known as maintenance medications. And those um, are used to help the brain adapt gradually to the absence of the drug. So um, similar to what Dr. Butler had mentioned, um, we develop a, a tolerance and dependence on those on the specific drug use, um, but there's ways to help our brain adapt to not having it. Um, and whether that be through decreasing drug cravings or just having more of a calming effect, a lot of patients have found those types of therapies very helpful. And then there's also drugs used to help prevent relapse. Um, 
specifically helping you develop um, coping mechanisms in terms of specific triggers, whether it be like places, things, or like moods that are impacting your cravings. And then in terms of cognitive um, behavioral therapy, I think it's something important to mention. Um, a lot of therapists who provide mental health services do with known as CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it has shown a lot of research that um, CBT is super helpful in helping patients with addiction reframe their thinking because um, a lot of time patients are fixated on one particular aspect of through their addiction that they're not able to see beyond it. Um, and it really does help reframe your thinking in a way that's positive and in a way that would help you decrease use of whatever you're addicted to. Um, there's also family therapy, like I mentioned before. Um, this has been especially helpful for young people who have close relationships with certain family members who could help them through their addiction journey. And then one other thing I do want to mention is also the 12-step facilitation program. Um, this is an individual therapy program delivered in like 12 weekly sessions for those who are interested specifically in certain addictions. Um, Alcoholic Anonymous is one that I can think of. Um, I did see a patient who of mine who has been addicted to alcohol very recently, and they have actually been pretty sober for the past three months now. And what I have found most helpful for them is having them not only do alcoholic anonymous, but also continuing to see their therapist, continuing to see their dependency counselor, and then continuing to see me for medications. Um, so I think that's all to say that we shouldn't just rely specifically on medications and we should try to access whatever resources we have possible. Um, Cause that's where you start to really develop the change and the tools necessary to cope with your addiction. So lastly here, I just want to go over some quick resources here in Washington for those who are interested more in learning about different treatment options for your addiction. Um, the, our wonderful host will send this PowerPoint out. Um, you can click through the different links here, um, but learnabouttreatment.org is a resource specifically for those in the community or for those uh, with specific substance use disorder or those who have friends and family. It's also helpful for us healthcare providers to learn more about treatment options and the goal is to provide more education around addiction. Um, the Washington Recovery Helpline provides anonymous confidential 24 hour help for Washington state residents experiencing substance use, as well as any problems with gambling and or a mental health challenge. Um, I've had patients who have accessed this line as well and they found it to be helpful in times where they may be in a crisis. Um, some additional resources here that I pulled up, um, Crisis Clinic, there's one in Seattle or King County, it's a 24-hour mental health crisis line, and then there's one specifically for Confidential Teen Answered Helpline, um, that's usually open evening 6 to 10, and then some more community resources, and then some youth care resources for those youth experiencing homelessness in King County. And then in terms of specific treatment locations, um, for those like seeking treatment facilities in US for substance use, there is this organization called SAM HSA or SAMHSA, which can be very helpful in finding a place as well as um, uh, accessing the suicide prevention line for a confidential support for those experiencing distress in loved ones. And then lastly, like I mentioned before, the stop over those.org, um, very helpful in the setting of our current opioid crisis here in Washington um, for those who are interested in learning more about the opioid crisis and learning more about naloxone, which is a medication used to reverse an overdose. Um, it can be very helpful to get that education and training, especially if you have a family who is addicted, a family member or friend who's addicted to opioids medications. Um, and that's pretty much it. I want to thank everyone for joining our talk and for listening. I want to leave this um, presentation open up to questions now. Um, I do see several here in the chat that I am just seeing now. So maybe yeah. Dr. Butler and I can address each one right now. 
Yeah, Justin, I'll just start by making sure that I covered the one from earlier. We had a question, do all addiction types affect the same area in the brain? And while the, the answer is a bit nuanced because each different kind of substance um, causes a different effect on many parts of the body and on the brain specifically, it is true that typically addiction results from that same modification of the reward pathways in the brain that use dopamine. So um, while the answer is really more complex at the surface level, yes, uh, all addiction types do affect that same area of the brain. Um, I uh, used to be a neuroscience uh, student and, and knew a lot, a lot more about the specific names of the specific areas of the brain, but um, Alas, I'm a more big picture person now. Um, and then we also had some questions about um, smoking and and um, folks that have been smoking for multiple years and, you know, worried about the effects it has on their health and, and trying to stop, which I applaud. It is not an easy decision to make to stop doing something like uh, smoking cigarettes. I do want to normalize also, uh, just like Dr. Ramos was saying, where relapse is often part of addiction um, and should not be considered a failure of treatment. I, I think the same is true for, for things like tobacco and smoking cigarettes. It takes the average person who smokes cigarettes eight really good attempts to quit smoking in order to have any kind of success long term, more than just a couple days. So it's very, very normal to be trying multiple times and you are 50% more likely to be successful in quitting smoking if you have someone else in your corner, like a counselor, a smoking cessation counselor to talk to and to check in with you and to be accountable. Um, because often people have more success if they know that someone who is not related to them, not their friend, it, it is going to have no bearing on your relationship with this person. They won't feel disappointed in you if you end up using tobacco again. It's really useful to have that counselor or as an outside third party. And those are the resources that I, I put in the chat that I want to highlight here. There's a link to a website from the Washington Department of Health about tobacco um, and how to quit. And then they have what's called the Washington State Quit Line. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, or quitline.com, or if you prefer to text, you can text READY to 200400. Um, these are great resources to help connect you with that kind of smoking cessation counselor. Again, it's it's a, a free service. It's a quit coach. Um, and sometimes you can, you can get free medications as well, things like nicotine gum or nicotine patches, or um, there's also a medication called Chantex that people can use to help smoking. So again, it's this combination of having a counselor and people really in your corner to help you process what your relationship is with the substance, as well as um, helping medications or uh, utilizing medications to help um, treat the the cravings, you know, reduce your cravings. We, I actually this morning gave someone an injection of a medication that lasts for an entire month to help reduce cravings for alcohol, a medication called Vivitrol. So, um, which is also available in tablet forms. Um, and then of course we have several different medications for opioid use disorders as well that help reduce cravings and, and treat withdrawal symptoms. So, if you're curious about what medications might be available for any substance you're using, please ask your doctor. Um, the only substances we really don't have something that we can use to treat well as, as a medication in addition to therapy are for meth use disorders. Um, we can kind of treat meth withdrawals in a way, but haven't found good medications for that or for, for cocaine quite so much. But um I, I, you know, people are working away in labs trying to find new medications for those as well. Um, and uh, with regard to, uh, we had a question about someone having some black spots on their nails. Um, that could be due to a wide variety of things. And in honesty, I would definitely need to see a picture of it to give you more specific advice. And and unfortunately, the purpose of this talk is not to give medical advice for individuals. So I would say you definitely need to to speak to your doctor about that one and schedule an appointment or, or go to an urgent care if you 
feel like um, you don't have a primary care doctor right now or, or you um, need to be seen uh, quickly. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. I did get a question that was sent directly to me, and it is, when is a good time to seek treatment for addiction? Um, this is a very good question. I think in terms of seeking treatment, I think it's important to think about how it's affecting not only you, but those around you, um, specifically for those who um, know that their addiction is causing harm to themselves and others. I think that's a perfect time to start seeking treatment. Um, those who tend to engage in behaviors that are outside of their norm, um, whether it is hanging out with specific groups of people or driving under the influence or anything else that would point towards the direction of seeking help, that would be my recommendation. Um, and it's also important to seek help when you feel like you're unable to quit on your own. Um, for some patients, they feel like this is something that they can do on their own. They, some people quit smoking cold turkey. Um, for those who have tried that method and have not succeeded, I think it's an important um, time to start seeking more professional help. Um, and lastly, I think in terms of thinking more about like the severe consequences of your addiction and if it's affecting your work, if it's affecting your family and friends, I think that's uh, a good time to start seeking help. And then a second question is, can cannabis use put you at risk for developing other substance use? And the answer to that is yes. Um, cannabis use for some people can be used as a way to relieve stress. And um, for some people it is linked towards um, behaviors that would promote you to use other substances. Um, one thing that we did not talk about in this presentation is that depending on where you're getting your drugs of use, um, sometimes they can be laced with other substances that we don't think about, specifically fentanyl. Um, so I think it's important to always make sure that you verify where you're getting these drugs and um, if the person you're getting it from is a reliable source, um, just because it can definitely put you at increased risk of addiction towards other things that you may not be aware of. Um, and then lastly, Dr. Butler here included an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous, which I talked about earlier, is um, support groups like Smart Recovery, um, which is an organization that supports those with addiction and people that are affected by loved ones addictions, which is very helpful. Okay. Um, Dr. Ramos, uh, I think some people do not know the, the meaning of the cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, 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 it would be nice to, uh, yeah. to let them know yeah. the, the other names for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mm -hmm. um, clarifying. So cannabis is also known as marijuana. It can also be known as THC or cannabinoids. Um, for the most term that people use is marijuana. Um, most people can get marijuana through a dispensary. Other people grow it. Um, so the main thing is making sure that if you are using marijuana is just making sure that it is a clean source and that you know where it's coming from. Um, happy to answer any more questions about that as well. Um, doctors, one question. Um... There are um, family members who are struggling to help their like teenagers and young young adults who are addicted to marijuana. What is the necessary steps that they can take to uh, you know get them the help that they need so they don't keep using this substance? Yeah, um, a, a great question. And I think, you know, marijuana is something that a lot of people in the state of Washington, where it's legal for recreational use, um, I have personal experience either with personal use or, or use from, uh, from friends and family members. And it is a substance that, you know, generally has a much lower propensity or, or lower likelihood, I should say, lower likelihood of um, causing addiction, but still can be uh, an addictive substance. Uh, like, like Justin mentioned, when you're using it consistently to treat anxiety or to help you sleep, um, and then that has negative consequences, maybe you're still high when you need to be not, um, or still high the next day when you wake up, 
or if it leads to um, use of other substances in conjunction with marijuana, that's when things become a problem. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, one of the ways, especially you raise the question of parents and, and teenagers, I think one of the ways you can really support your teenager if, if you wonder whether they are struggling with an addiction to marijuana or another substance is, is to have a non-judgmental approach and let them know that you are someone that they can come to to talk about anything and you're you even if you may feel upset with them that that um you you need to thank them for sharing information with you or to coming to you for help if they do so um i feel like a lot of teenagers experiencing or experimenting with substances for the first time might feel lost or overwhelmed and and you know you, you can be a, a supportive and safe individual for that person to come to for for help um i think in, in you know in terms of of how to support as a parent i would also encourage your your kids to to talk to their pediatrician about it um you know, a lot of kids are not comfortable discussing sensitive topics with their their parents, and that's completely normal. Um, we hope that they would share everything, but sometimes, you know, they're really trying to assert their independence. And and I think, you know, making sure that they know that the doctor is a safe place to talk about things like drugs and sex and depression um, is also really helpful. Um, and then there are some some organizations here that um, I believe are linked in in the resources that that uh, Dr. Ramos had put in the slides. Um, and I know the Smart Recovery Group as well has some programs that focus on youth as well. Um, I do want to add on um, what what we were saying earlier about Smart Recovery. I just bring them up also because I know that they have support groups for people who have a loved one with addiction and maybe don't are not suffering from addiction personally themselves, but have someone in their life that is, um, because that can also be a, a really uh, big problem for people if you're trying constantly to help this person that you love, and they're just not in a place yet where they're able to stop their addiction and interrupt that cycle. And then in those cases, it's really important to protect yourself, too, um, from, from, uh, you know, giving up too much of yourself or enabling their their ongoing behaviors and protecting them from the consequences of their actions. I actually have a handbook here with me that I, I frequently reference for patients. That's like the Smart Recovery Friends and Families Handbook, and and you know, folks go through this in their support groups and has lots of exercises to to talk about how you behave around the people in your life with addiction. So that's helpful too. And then I want to make sure that we get to the one of the last questions here. I think we might be running short on time, but um, somebody asked, do we have patients who identify as immigrants and do we approach them the same way as our white patients? Excellent question. Thank you so much for asking. Yes, we definitely have lots of patients who are people of color, lots of patient, patients who are um, immigrants um, from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, Justin and I both work at the same clinic at Swedish First Hill Family Medicine. We are a clinic that sees a lot of people that don't speak English. Um, maybe they speak Amharic or Vietnamese or Spanish. Um, and we definitely really, you know, the, the principles of good medical care and good primary care apply to everybody. We, we want to treat everyone with respect that they deserve when they walk into our door. We want to meet everyone where they are and help understand what are their health goals um, and not not impose things upon them. Um, so so I, I you know I'd like to say yes we treat everybody the same but in reality we we treat everybody with respect um, but we treat everybody differently because everybody has different needs right um, and and so we we try to be very respectful and and open with our patients um, and you know I as a white person I'll say I I make mistakes and I really hope that my patients. Um, tell me when I make mistakes, um, because I want to work to be anti-racist, and our clinic shares that goal as well. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you raising the question. Um, and I will say to to the the personal health question about the the nail again. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. This is not a space for uh, for individual medical advice. I, I encourage you to send a picture of of that to your primary care doctor if you can over my chart or schedule an appointment. 
Um, I am sorry, I can't help you with that directly. But if you want, if you want to come in and see Justin or I and talk about addiction or talk about any other medical problems, then of course you're welcome to contact our clinic. But my my, my goal here is not to to market. <laughs> yeah, Doctor Bola, thank you. I know we're out of time almost, but th there's a one quick question for you. Uh, we know that you know secondhand smoking affects children. Can you talk about a little bit briefly? How can smoking marijuana affect the kids if you smoke around them? Um, Justin, you want to take that? You want me to take it? Yeah, um, so I can talk a little bit about secondhand smoking. Um, for marijuana specifically, there are a lot of toxic substances in marijuana that um, can be very harmful, specifically for children whose like lungs aren't entirely like are essentially still developing. Um, in many ways, I don't know specifically if um, it would like lead to an increased use of it in the future, but. Um, for some patients, especially children who have asthma or what's known as like restrictive lung disease, that can actually be very triggering for them. Um, so I think in many ways, limiting ex exposure to secondhand smoke would be very recommended. Um, there still needs to be a lot more research um, to look into what that would mean, but it's very much similar to secondhand tobacco smoke where we don't want to expose any specific harmful substances to children specifically. Uh, and I think the takeaways are no smoking in the car, even with the windows down, uh, no smoking in the car with your kids in the car and smoke outside if you have children in the household marijuana or cigarettes <laughs> and then there's one question about thoughts about how to taper kids off of social media or technology ad addiction um very very um helpful or very very thoughtful question um, we see it a lot nowadays in terms of being addicted to phones iphones um ipads um our counseling is usually limiting it to two hours a day which can be hard in the setting of using it for like schoolwork um a lot of times it requires you to also think, be more creative about how we're uh, taking care of our children, um, offering them opportunities to do exercise or to be out more um, can be very helpful and trying to set strict boundaries and limits in terms of how much um, screen time they're actually having. And then really briefly, I see a question, is uh, smoking affecting erections and fertility? I just wanna say briefly, Yes, cigarette smoking can contribute to erectile dysfunction because it um, worsens your vascular health, the, the blood vessels um, that are needed for erections. And for fertility, I don't know that we have a lot of great data about how if you're a person with a uterus that could carry a child, um, how smoking affects fertility, but it, I, I would imagine it negatively affects it. It definitely leads to complications in pregnancy and we encourage people if they become pregnant to stop smoking. Um, and it just increases your risk of preterm birth, like early birth. Um, and then if you're a man or someone who produces sperm who is smoking, I do not ha I have any awareness that that negatively affects for your fertility. All right. Well, thank Great you so questions. much, doctors. Those are all awesome questions and comments. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, doctors, for a great presentation. I, I hope that you will uh, forward us the links and things like that so we can share them out um, to our members. Absolutely. Zainab, I will send you the slides right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you later, OK? Thank you very much.